So today my text is coming out of 1 Samuel chapter 16. Now, if anybody remembers what we, I kind of started a series, it was the first one. But the last time I spoke, I started a series on David. Anybody remember that? No? Okay, it's okay. But we started on David and we talked about the anointing of David. All right? And that was um, Samuel came and we saw how the Lord directed the anointing of David, even to leading Samuel to the place where David was, leading Samuel to see all of his brothers in succession, and leading Samuel to ask if there's anyone else. We saw the Lord speak, we saw him say yes, and we saw him say no several different times within this passage. And it was a, 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 an amazing text. It was um, a little bit too easy to preach because there was so much good material within this text. So of course, I wanted to continue that journey, continue that journey with you, talk about after David's anointing, what happens. So this, two weeks ago, I started looking in into this text a little bit closer and then I realized the next verse is one of the most contested verses and most difficult verses to preach on in the entire Bible. So great. It left me with a big challenge on my hands to talk about this text. But I hope the Lord is going to speak to somebody today. Amen. Just bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we welcome the Holy Spirit into this place. Holy Father, Heavenly Father, we just acknowledge your presence right now in this place, God. We acknowledge your power, and we acknowledge the ways in which you operate, Lord God. We acknowledge the order in who you are, Lord. We pray, Lord, that in the name of Jesus, that you would start to speak and move in the hearts of your people right now as I deliver this message. God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that each and every barrier that the enemy has placed in this building, in this room, every, every unimaginable barrier that has been put up by the enemy to blockade your word from penetrating into their heart and to their lives, in the name of Jesus, we pray that by your spirit, you would start to break down every single thing that is blocking us from your word. We pray, Lord, that every seed sown here today shall fall on good ground in the mighty name of Jesus and shall come forth fruitful. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. So like I said last time, we saw David's anointing. We saw Samuel's consistent obedience to the word of the Lord. We saw the spirit of the Lord fall heavily on David. And we also looked at how that translates in the new covenant, where you as a child of Christ have the same access to the same spirit. Something that was not existent in the Old Testament, but by the blood of Jesus Christ, he grants us access to the Holy Spirit. Whether you're Jew, Gentile, priest, or poor, you have access to the same anointing that David has. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that phenomenal to think the power of Jesus Christ came in such a way that we, he moved in such a way supernaturally that there's things we can't even understand that the power of Jesus Christ on that cross and resurrection, the, the access that he opened up to humanity. Amazing, amazing uh, anointing that fell on David. So we go into uh, chapter 16, verse 14. So just at that same breath where this anointing fell heavily on David, we go into David moving to Saul's service. Now the spirit of the Lord, at the same time the spirit of God moved heavily into David. The next verse says, now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. And this is, this is where it gets very difficult to preach on 
or to explain or to understand what the Lord and the Bible says here. And it's a very still very contended topic. And an evil spirit, also uh, another translation says, a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented Saul. Are you telling me, okay, let me not preach it yet. Let's keep reading. So Saul's attendants said to him, Saul's attendants, we have a spirit from the Lord, we have Saul, and now we have his attendants, okay? See, so they were able to discern this, okay? The servants were able to discern this. See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you, and that's a big G, not a little G. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the harp. He'll play when the evil spirit from God comes on you, and you'll feel better. Amazing discernment from the servants, right? So Saul said, find someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I seen a son. They didn't even have to look. One of the servants immediately answered and said, you know what? I've seen this this boy, son of Jesse. Now, I want to point this out, okay? This is before David and the Goliath, right? This is right after his anointing, before he's done anything, okay? Now, hear the description from the servants. We picture David at this point, and I'll pause here. We picture David because of Sunday school. We picture a little boy, right? That's, that's what we've been, the imagery we've been assumed at this point. He has not fought anything. He's been in the pasture all this time, okay? Now, I want you to see how the devil will take a description of somebody and twist it, and we get stuck with the enemy's description. We don't see the description of the true man. And I want to say this, but the Sunday school description of David is Goliath's description of David. It is not God's description of David. And we as a church get stuck on what the enemy has called us for year after year after year. The enemy's description becomes my description. But I want you to pay close attention to this verse and see how they describe David before Goliath was even an issue, okay? Immediately when I started preaching, you guys pictured a little boy, David, taking care of the sheep. But watch this description, okay? There's a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the harp. He's a brave man. And what? Come on. Is that the description we think of? Why do we rely on Goliath's description when he says, you come to me with a boy? Of course, we're going to, that's the image we get stuck of with David. No, David was not a boy. He was a warrior. He speaks well, and he's a pretty good looking man. And the Lord is with him. Some of us need to start describing ourselves in this, in chapter 16 and not in chapter 17. Sometimes we look inwardly and we say, but I'm just a kid. Oh, I'm preaching again, sorry. That's another one of my topics. Let's just get through the text. Chapter, uh, verse 19. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son, David. Very specific there. Not one of your other sons. Send me your son, David, who is with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey, loaded it with bread, the skin of wine, and a young goat, and sent them with his son, David, to Saul. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him so much, and David became one of his armor bearers. Then Saul sent with word to Jesse, saying, please allow David to stay with me. Let him stay in my service. I'm so pleased with him. And whenever the Spirit of God came on Saul, 
David would take up his harp and play, and relief would come to Saul, and he would feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. My topic today is repositioned from the pastor to the palace. Repositioned from the pastor, pastor, <laughs> my face is still a little numb, from the pasture to the palace. Now, it sounds like a wonderful repositioning, but I want to show you the fight and the spiritual battles that the church has to endure when God calls you from one place to another, from one level of service to another. Now, we're talking about, we're going to equate all of these things from the pastor to the palace and see how God will elevate your service level as you mature in your walk with God. Amen? All right, so let's dig into the word here. So we, we just read this text from 14 to 23, and we saw different aspects, okay? So I want to point out a couple things. Saul, we have Saul, we have David, but we also have Saul's servants. We have an object, which is the harp of David. Uh, we have um, a spirit, so something not physical. We have things that are physical. We have people. We have... Uh, uh, objects, and we also have a spirit, something that's outside of our normal realm. My first point I want to point out here in this text is regardless of all of these things, they were, whether they were saved, not saved, whether they were sinners, not sinners, whether they were of high class, low class, had no class, a harp, and something that was even evil, what did all of these things have in common in this text? They were orchestrated under the will of God. Now, I want you to understand why God used all of these things in this passage. He used a tormenting evil spirit. He used the king of Israel, Saul. He used his, Saul's servants specifically to bring David into Saul's service. Can you sit there and think of any other reason why God would use all of these things? I'm telling you this for a reason. There is not anything in this world, whether it's a situation at work, whether it's an ailment within your body, whether it's uh, stress within your marriage, whether it's issues with your children, there is nothing that God cannot use to put you in a place where he wants to put you. There is nothing that can deny the word from the Lord. There is nothing that is not subject. Even evil spirits are subject to his name. Even the wickedness that is around us in our culture and our community is subject to his name. There is nothing good or evil in this earth, seen or unseen, that does not obey the word of the Lord. Come on, church. I don't know what you came in with today. I don't know what issue you have been facing with today, but there is nothing Nothing, nothing that can stop the word of the Lord. Everything subjects itself unto his will. Everything. Whether you know it or you don't. Everything subjects itself unto his will. So whatever spiritual blockade you have been facing. Now I equate everything to spiritually. Like last week, that issue with my face, that, to me, that was a demon. And I was rebuking it like it was a demon. Because what? We wrestle not with flesh. We don't wrestle with flesh and blood. When we speak to 
some issues within people. We're not speaking to their body. We're not speaking to their cells. We're not speaking to their bones. We're speaking to the powers and principalities that are subject and have taken dominion over these bodies. We have to speak in the spirit. We have to move and operate in the spirit. There is a whole world of things that we don't see and understand. But you as a believer in Christ, through the blood of Jesus Christ, have the authority to tear down spiritual things. We need to start walking in the spirit and moving and talking in the spirit. We need to start working in the spirit. Why? Because if you don't do it, no one else is going to. We have a world full of lost people, full of unbelievers, full of people who have not accepted Jesus Christ. And those responsibilities of working in the spirit is exclusive to those who believe in Jesus Christ. You are unique. And you have a powerful God who can do amazing, miraculous things. We're in a spiritual battle, amen? So starting with verse 14, that was not even in my notes. Sorry, this is going to be a long one, Pastor. Uh, verse 14, now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. Now I want you to, as I began to pray and meditate on what this meant, how would the Lord send an evil spirit? And so the contention is within in the atheist world. They point to this verse and say, you know, you see all these evil things in the world? God is doing. Your God, if, if he could uh, extract all the evil, um, they point to this verse and say, see, God can do it. God, in this verse, it says the Lord. Now, if you go all the way back to the original translation, in every single analysis of this text, it clearly states that the Lord sent an evil spirit to trouble Saul. Now, to me, that's a little bit interesting, but we, we just heard how everything subjects itself under the will of God. And we also saw that why God did this to bring David into the palace, right? And under Saul's good grace. Now, I want you to understand another aspect of this. And it paints a really good picture of our society today. And this is why I want to talk about it. Now, in, in this building, right? We have a couple windows, but let's say we blacked out every single window, completely dark, and at once we turned off all the lights. What would happen? It'd be dark, completely dark. There's an interesting principle there in that light and dark cannot exist in the exact same space at any one given time. There's a, an interesting principle there that as soon as I take that light out, there's darkness. And we see it all through the Bible. We see it in the beginning when the Lord created the earth, that the earth was void and full of darkness. It's almost an inherent sinful nature that as soon as God's presence is void, there's a presence of darkness. And we see in this verse that the Lord removed his spirit. Now Saul was anointed by God. Saul was anointed with oil by God as king of Israel. But he disobeyed God time and time again. And here we see a situation where God enacted his judgment while Saul was living. He didn't wait for hell to come or for him to pass, to throw him in Sheol. He enacted, one interpretation is that he enacted judgment on Saul while he was still living. Or you could say that he was orchestrating all of this with a tormenting spirit to bring David into Saul's service. 
But in any event, that tormenting spirit could not be there if Saul was still under God's anointing. Church, you are anointed by the Spirit of the Lord. And we live in a world that is increasingly and increasingly and increasingly filled with darkness. We don't have to go very far beyond the church walls to see people tormented. And when I say tormented, I mean spiritually tormented by depression and anxiety. It's coming on even children in elementary school are suffering with anxiety, depression, and fear. You don't have to go very far to see the increasing void of the Holy Spirit. And as the Lord pulls back because the sin of man becomes so great, there are things that torment this generation. One of the things, like gender confusion, Ten years ago, that, that wasn't a thing, but now it's one of the most important issues that's put on our political ballot. In such a short amount of time, the Spirit of God has pulled back so much that these tormenting spirits have come in like a flood and are impacting our neighbors, our children, our communities. There's such darkness today, all because the light of his Holy Spirit is not in every facet of our community. They took the Bibles out of schools. You know, when I went to elementary school, I went to a, a Catholic school on 50, and every Friday we had chapel, and every day we had Bible school, a Bible class. And although at the time, my mom was Hindu, and I would kind of go between the churches with my mom and with my dad. But that word that was in me from that school, regardless of your religion, really set the tone for my life. And those opportunities are, are ripped away from our kids. My, my children will never have those opportunities. Now. I don't want to talk about politics, so I'm going to stop there. But you know where, which color I'm voting for. <laughs> um, there's, there's a rise in these spiritual issues in our community. And I want to show you the amazing gift God has give, give, given his church. Amen? Let's see how we deal with these things. You know, we look at the New Testament when Jesus was giving his Sermon on the Mount. And you know what one of the things he said? You are the light of what? The world. The city what? Cannot be hidden. Maybe that's what he meant. That God's presence has been pulled so much out of this world and darkness has spiritual darkness has come in like a flood and filled every caveat of our community and then when he says in Matthew he says you are the light to this world you are like a city that has been set on a hill that draws men to it we need to walk in that light. We need to understand that that's our purpose as the church, is to bring people in to the presence and comfort of God. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> so let's move down to verse 15. Saul's attendants said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord, lowercase l, meaning Saul, 
command his servants here to search for someone who can play the harp. He will play when an evil spirit comes from God, from God comes on you, and you'll feel better. I, I read this verse like 10 times, trying to understand how, how would the servant just assume or even know this? Is it experience? Like, it, was it a thing back then where you had an evil spirit come on you and somebody would come play the harp? I, historically, I don't think that was practice. Culturally, I don't think that was practice. It wasn't like an obia, like doing, like, it wasn't this thing, <laughs> you know? It wasn't a thing where if an evil spirit came on you that you you know, get a, a broom and you sweep here or do something. It wasn't a pra- it wasn't a superstition. So it really perplexed me to see how God really used this situation and servants and somebody unrelated to speak exactly into this situation. Now, we could look at our own lives and we could see either, are, are, am I the one being tormented? And are others speaking? Is God trying to speak through others that are around me into my life? Or are you somebody that's surrounding the tormented? Are you someone that's around the tormented that God really wants to use you to speak into somebody's life? Now, this is such an amazing thing when you think about it, that in every single one of our lives, I bet you we can all pick at least one person that has been tormented. Currently, if you call them up, you know they're going through something. They need a prayer. They need somebody to talk to them. But now with our community and social media, we've gotten so disconnected even though we're connected. We've, we, we get addicted to scrolling and we get addicted to looking at uh, reels and we get addicted to, to serving our own family and we, we lose that connection of the same circle that God put you in. Now, one of the most powerful things that I could come up in here and preach every single Sunday, but the, there's two people in this world that I will have the most impact on. And they sit at my dining table every single night. Your ministry is really that tight circle that God has put you in. Sometimes it's not about speaking to the masses. Sometimes it's speaking to the one. And God can use you in that one circumstance in a way that no one else can. Just imagine if Saul didn't have somebody speaking that word into him. David would have never come into Saul's service unless somebody had the audacity to think that a harp would turn this tormenting spirit away. You are important in the circle that you're in. You, are, you could be a lifeline to somebody who really needs it. Amen? Amen. So Saul, verse 17, so Saul said to his attendants, find someone who plays well and bring him to, to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the harp. He's a brave man, a warrior. We talked about that point already, right? So going down to verse 19. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son, David, who is with the sheep. Now, I, I, took, this, uh, I took this method from Pastor D., who said, if you see a name, circle it and replace it with your name. So I want you to uh, take this verse, if you have your word, I want you to circle that name, that word David. All right. Send me Michael, thy son, which is which which is with the sheep. This 
is the calling. This is the calling. This is the calling. This is the time where David was called into service. And I believe the same thing happens when the Lord is calling and orchestrating something in your life. I want you to circle this, Rebecca, and say in your word, this is the time when the Lord is saying, send me, Rebecca, thy daughter, who is among the sheep. See, the church over the last couple decades has gotten into this mode of serving sheep. And I'm not saying this to rebuke anyone, but we have mega churches. And I look around, we have mega churches that bring in millions and millions of dollars, and they spend millions and millions of dollars to serve the sheep. We have pastors and pastors that are, and there's nothing wrong about serving the sheep. But if all we do is focus on the sheep, we forget the souls. We've got into a mode as Christian churches and believers in focusing on the sheep and not the souls. We forget about the tormented. We forget about the hurting. We forget about the ones who need the comfort and love of the Father. We focus on the sheep and forget the souls. I hope that in my lifetime, I see more of an upbringing of these type of churches, the small community churches that work and operate in the way that they should, and that is focused on the community impact that is feeding the souls, the tormented, the people who are dealing with depression and anxiety, the people that are hurting and bleeding and needing a savior. So the Lord says, bring me David, who is amongst the sheep. And so now we see an elevation of service, one from sheep in the pasture to kings in the palace. It's a scary thing to leave what your comfort is. And I'm sure for David it was a little bit frightening to know I've got to leave this place where I'm comfortable. I've got to leave my comfort zone amongst the sheep. I know how to serve the sheep. I know how to take care of them. Even if a wolf comes, I know how to deal with it. But now I'm going into the king's service and dealing with tormenting spirits? Hey, the elevation of service into the palace is not an easy one. It's not a comfortable one. When God elevates you out of serving sheep into serving souls, it's a scary place. You feel like you're going through the valley of the shadow of death constantly, constantly surrounded by evil. That's, but that's the very place where God is going to win the souls. That's the very place where you're going to be seeing your gifts, these gifts that God has given you. Drive out spirits. Drive out spirits. Drive out evil. Sometimes you have to do it in the palace. You cannot stay in the pasture. And we as a church have gotten so comfortable coming here week after week, feeding the sheep. And I feel on my spirit, and I'm sorry if it offends anybody, but we have to get back out into the community. We have to. Or else we miss the point. We miss the point, and we miss the calling. Amen? Amen? Now, this part is so powerful. It's a sermon on its own. But verse 20, Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread and a skin of wine. Now, when you change your service location from the pasture to the palace, I want to tell you, 
your father sends you with something. He sent you with a sacrifice. He sent you with the broken body of Jesus Christ. He sent you with the blood that was shed on Calvary. He sent you with something, church. He sends you with everything you need to face any and every situation that comes your way. He is sending you not on your own, but your father sends you with his son, with the blood from his side and his body which was broken. Be bold and walk out into this dark world knowing that every single thing that you come across will subject itself unto the name of Jesus Christ. He is a powerful father. He anoints you with his spirit and he sends you with his son. He sends you with his blood. Walk in power, church. Walk in power knowing the God that you serve. Knowing the powerful Father that you serve. Go in the anointing. Go in the spirit. And go in the full power of our Father. Hallelujah. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him so much, David became his armor barrier. Then Saul sent word to Jesse saying, allow him to remain in my service. Now, church, we just equated Saul to the tormented. As soon as you start praying with the people in your circle, as soon as you start ministering to these people, as soon as you start getting and giving them encouraging text messages and feeding the word into your circle. Guess what? They're going to be asking, don't go. Don't go. Let them stay with me. Let them stay with me. Continue to feed that person with an encouraging word, a text. Call somebody and pray with them. And I promise you, you'll see how that tormenting spirit will leave them and they will continue to want more of the Lord. They're going to continue to come. They're going to ask you which church you go to. I promise you, test the Lord and see if it's not true. Test him and see what happens. Continue to continue to continue to work in the spirit, work in the power that God has given you, and see that it's not true. Verse 23, and this is where I'm going to wrap it up, but also talk about a couple of things. Whenever the spirit from God came on Saul, David would take his harp, okay, and play, and relief would come to Saul. Now, before David ever came in to Saul's service, he had an ability to play the harp. He had an ability and a gift He had this musical gift. And we see it all through Psalms, what a wonderful gift David had, truly. It was unique, and it was given by God, right? God was able to use this gift in such a way where evil spirits, even though his spirit was not the one moving this tormenting spirit away. But we see in this passage that God uses a gift of David, anoints it, and uses it for spiritual battles. It wasn't about the harp. The harp wasn't anointed. He didn't gain this gift after he was anointed. He had this gift all along. But God was able to use his gift and his um, object for spiritual battles. 
I'm saying it really slow so it sinks in. Now, I want you to equate that to what you have in your toolbox. What have you been working on? Like, for me, I play the guitar and the, and the piano. But I didn't always do that. That was something I had to develop. And it's a gift that I really believe on a Sunday morning when I come in here, as soon as I start playing, I really truly feel that the spirit of the Lord can start to move in somebody's tormenting spirit. I really honestly believe that God can use it and that God does use it. And God can use your words if you're a great eloquent speaker or an eloquent writer, that God can use your words. That is your gift. God can use your gift to move mountains, to break down walls, to break chains. God can use your gift to fight spiritual battles. Now, we talked a lot about spiritual things. We talked about light and darkness. We talked about how the world is full of darkness and needing the light of the Lord. We talked about your small circle. Now, let's focus on how you can impact someone with an anointed gift. Sister Rita, remember when uh, my mother-in-law was sick and you cooked up that meal? You cooked chicken curry and and chow mein, and I, she has a gift, okay? She, it's not just singing up here, but she's got a, a gift. You can use cook, cooking, you can feed people, you can, don't take feeding people lightly, because the word of the Lord says to close those that are naked and feed those that are hungry. That week, we were very hungry, okay? And Sister Rita Use her gift, and it blessed us. It really, really does. I still remember. I st still think my uh, hands smell of the curry a little bit. <laughs> but you might have a gift of cooking. You might have a gift of love. Like, you just love loving people. You just might have a gift of, of an encouraging word. You might have a... There's so many gifts. Every single one of us in this room has a gift. Now let God use that gift. Let him use it. You're already anointed. You're already a child of God. Just let God use your gift. And then let him do the rest. You don't have to pray over people with anointed oil to see demons flee. You don't. It didn't happen here. David didn't have to take anointed oil and put it on Saul and put it on the harp and play. The, the spirit fleed as soon as he started using his gift. Use your gift, church. Use your gift. Serve others, and you'll see how God will do the rest. Amen? We fight spiritual battles. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with powers and principalities and against rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Whether you're in the pasture or in the palace, I promise you, as a child of God, you are facing spiritual battles. God has equipped you with the blood of his son, the broken body, and we could even go into Luke chapter 10, my favorite verse, where Jesus says, I send you with the power and authority to trample, trample, trample on the heads of scorpions and snakes. And the most beautiful part of it, he says, guess what? You will not be harmed. You go into fearful places. Saul's service was a fearful place. In the presence of snakes and scorpions is a fearful place. This past week, there was a spider the, hand, the size of my face in, our, in Ezra's bedroom. That was a fearful place. But you know what I did and my, my mother-in-law did? It went under the bed. I disassembled the bed. I took every, everything. That, the, the room looks like somebody tried to steal, like came in and ransacked the place. Still. But you know what we did? She went in one area, started praying. 
because the spider was huge and it, and it hid under his bed. And I said, and I was in the room looking for the spider for two hours, right? Two hours. And I said, Lord, please let this spider come out. Please, Lord, please. It doesn't matter what situation you're facing, but God's word still is in control. I'll tell you what happened, and it's the craziest thing. And I'm the only one who can ver verify that this story is true. So, <laughs> so we prayed, we prayed. I said, you know what? I'm going to give up. I'm going to go and start putting some things in the, in the garage. I went into the garage, and I had sprayed spray and all that stuff. But I went in the garage, and I came out, and I, I went to the room, and I saw this spider walk under the door and stop right before me and fall down. I swear on my life, it, it limped out of the room by itself right on the door. Just like I asked, I said, Lord, let this spider come out and show itself. And I went, I walked back to the room. I saw it almost like it was, it submit. And I, I saw it right before me, and then I called for pastor to come clean it up. <laughs> Everything subjects itself unto the name of Jesus Christ. I don't know what spiritual battles you're facing today and, or what spiritual battles will come tomorrow, but I promise you, church, by the name of Jesus Christ, Everything subjects itself unto his name. We need to start working in we need to start working in the spirit of the Lord a little bit more. Amen. A little bit more. Understand the power that God has gifted you. Understand the anointing that you're under and respect it. Respect the anointing and the name of the Lord. And you'll see how things will start to move. Amen? Give God some praise. Give him some praise.